And uh, we're happy tonight to be joined with missionary Roy Well and his wife. <clears throat> and uh, these are heroes. I'm going to say that again. The Wells are heroes. <clears throat> I look at them as heroes. Hear me, folks. 60 years of apostolic ministry, faithful ministry. <clears throat> and so we're delighted that Brother and Sister Well are joining us tonight. We're also being joined by Queen Mother. And she is a hero. She is a hero. She came to the Lord. How old were you when you got the Holy Ghost? 13 years old when she got the Holy Ghost. Now she's 33. <laughs> plus. <laughs> but she has never turned back, never walked away. Always been faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ in her life. And so I sit among heroes tonight and so happy that these folks are joining us. And we're going to talk about soul winning and uh, there's a couple of things I'd like to say before we even get to your outlines. First of all, I think the Lord would have us tonight to understand that soul winning is attainable. You can become a soul winner. Well, that was about 30% of you. It's about 30%. So let's try it again. Soul winning is attainable. You can, you can become a soul winner. <clears throat> Sometimes we place soul winning way up here. And the truth of the matter is, it's right down here where we walk where we drive, where we shop, among our neighbors, our family. Come on, somebody. Soul winning is attainable, and I hope tonight that that message will get across to you. So thank you for joining us, and we're going to go to the outlines and trust that the Lord will help us here tonight. Now, we left space on your notes. <clears throat> Excuse me. We left space on your notes for you to be able to write in notes. If you hear something from Sister Henson or Sister Well or Brother Well and you say, I'd like to hold on to that, you can write it right in the spaces that are provided and uh, that's for your benefit. So our topic tonight is, so you want to be a soul winner. And we're going to look at some scriptures here and these scriptures are fabulous, fabulous. Proverbs chapter 11 verse number 30, and I've given it to you here in several different translations. First of all, the King James Version says, and why don't we read this, this one together, are you ready? The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. All right. Now, out of the New Century Version, it reads like this, a good person gives life to others. Think about that for a moment. A good person gives life to others. The wise person teaches others how to live. The easy to read translation reads like this. What good people produce is like a life-giving tree. Those, I like this, those who are wise give new life to others. Amen. Folks, you'll never be happier. You'll never have a greater experience on earth than for God to use you to touch somebody with new life. To see somebody that's distraught, somebody that's broken, somebody that's confused, 
somebody that's full of despair and for God to use you to touch their life and give them new life, that's an exciting, exciting thing. The New International Reader's Version says this, the fruit that godly people bear is like a tree of life. And those who lead others to do what is right are wise. And then today's new international version reads like this. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life and those who win souls are wise. Now these scriptures should cause every apostolic believer to want to be a soul winner. Thank you. We're slowly gaining <laughs> response. And I understand it's Wednesday night, some of you came in tired, but we're gonna talk about something exciting here tonight. All right? These scriptures, what we just read, if you have any holy fire in you at all, ought to make you wanna be a soul winner. For one's life to give life to others especially eternal life is the ultimate meaning of a well-lived and significant life now take a moment with me folks and think of this for just a moment to be the primary cause of someone being in heaven for all eternity is in itself a fabulous reward that far exceeds all other earthly accomplishments. If you believe that, would you give the Lord praise right now? Hallelujah. What a wonderful thing to look across heaven and see somebody that you were the primary cause that they made it to the holy city. You interacted with them. You connected with them for the gospel's sake. And their life was transformed. They were changed. They were on their way to hell. But they met Jesus in you. And their life was transformed. And then they're standing on streets of gold. And for you to stand there and know that you were a primary cause of them being there. Folks, what could... What could surpass? What could surpass that? Now notice that I said primary cause. Primary cause. Because I don't know that there's anybody that's led to Jesus by just one person. Most everybody that's won to Jesus, there may be a primary cause but there's other people involved too that played a role and helped to win that, pe that person, helped to nurture that person, helped to bring that person along, helped to love that person, helped to pray for that person, all right? So let us not look at this as though we're gonna be responsible by ourselves for somebody else being in heaven. I don't really think that's probably true. I think probably all of us that end up in heaven will be there as the result of many people who contributed to our life. Praise God. Come on, somebody. Another thing is we should be very careful when dealing with new converts. We must never look at them as our converts. Don't ever talk about somebody that the Lord used you to help win. Don't ever call them your spiritual babies. They're not your babies. Hello? They are the products of Jesus Christ working in you and through you, but also in and through others. The reason why I say that is because there is a downside if somebody tries to take ownership of a new convert. Hello? Nobody owns us but Jesus. Hello? Even Bishop doesn't own us. Pastor doesn't own us. The person that was the primary cause in our being saved doesn't own us. When you're saved, you belong to Jesus. 
Jesus. Praise God. So we're going to talk about soul winning tonight. And uh, the first question is, precisely where and how does soul winning begin in the life of a disciple of Jesus? Where does soul winning start? What sparks soul winning? Brother Well, would you like to lead off for us, please? It begins in preparation and dedication. 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show yourself approved. Yes. Psalms 1.3, and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth his fruit in his season, and whatsoever he does shall prosper. A tree doesn't give fruit immediately. It waits for its season. It goes through winter, it goes through spring, it goes through summer, and then finally it goes through fall, and most of the time that's when it gives its fruit. Now, it's a time after planting, growing, maturing, and pruning. Do not be become discouraged if you do not have results tomorrow. That's good. So, Brother Well has told us that soul winning is sparked. It starts with consecration, dedication. Sister Well, would you like to add to that? When does it start? Acts 1, 8. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, that's at home, and in all Judea, that's neighborhood, area around, and, and in Samaria, that is to the outcast, other people. And then it says, and unto the uttermost part of the earth, that is the world. And how does it begin? I believe that it begins with a true conversion. A lot of people are not really converted in their hearts when they receive the Holy Ghost. We need a true conversion in our hearts. So I think it begins with a true conversion and believing that any that is lost, that anybody is lost if they don't have Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. All right, this is very good. It starts with a true conversion. It starts with consecration. You want to be a soul winner, so you want to be a soul winner. It starts, first of all, with being saved yourself. True conversion. And then consecration, dedication. And during that process of consecration and dedication, there should be a spark ignited in a person's heart to want to share what they have with others. I would call that spark desire. Nobody becomes a soul winner, at least I don't think it happens. I won't say nobody, but let's just say it would be very rare that soul winning would happen accidentally. When soul winning happens, it happens because somebody has a desire to be used of God, to share what they have with other folks. Now let's go to uh, the book of Romans. This is top of page two. Romans chapter 1, verses 13 through 16. And I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Please follow along. This is Paul writing to the church at Rome. I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, that I plan many times to visit you, but I was prevented until now. I want, everybody say, I want. Everybody say, I want. I want. This is the Apostle Paul, and he said, I have a desire. Yeah. I want to work among you and see spiritual fruit, just as I have seen among other Gentiles. Paul said, I'm eager to come to Rome to minister to, among you because I want to win some souls. I want to see spiritual fruit just as I have seen other places. So notice that desire is crucial. 
And then Paul says in verse 14, for I have a great sense of obligation to people in both the civilized world and the rest of the world, to the educated and uneducated alike. Notice, a great sense of obligation. I feel responsible, not only have desire, but I feel responsible to share what I have. And folks, if we truly have feelings of desire and responsibility, we will not care who it is. We will not care what their ethnicity is. We will not care what their status is. We will not care even how their clothes look. I'm talking about if we really have a desire and an obligation to reach people. I believe we ought to be able to put our arm around somebody in the altar that may not even smell good. Hello? May not look good. Come on, somebody. But when you have a desire and you feel an obligation, it's a soul that you're after. Many years ago when my dad first became the pastor in Warsaw, Indiana, my goodness, that was in the 50s, mid-50s. He first became the pastor. Kind of an interesting story. There were 15 preachers that tried out for the church. 15 preachers tried out for a church that ran about 30. And uh, 14 of the 15 told the congregation that it was the will of God for them to become the pastor. The only one that didn't say that was my dad, and he was the one that was elected pastor. It's just kind of interesting. One of the men who wanted the church and had told the church it was the will of God for him to be there decided since he didn't get the church, he would come and start a church across town. And that's what he did. And uh, my father met with him and talked with him, trying to have a workable relationship. And he said to my father in so many words, and I'm not using any names here because I'm not here to throw somebody under the bus. I'm just trying to make a point with you. He said to my father in so many words, the Lord has sent me here to reach the upper crust. And the Lord has you here to reach the others. Now, that wasn't the exact words he used, but that was very definitely the message that he got across. And that's sad, folks. The church is open to whosoever will may come. Unfortunately, that work did not survive because it was on the wrong foundation. You know, the people, we can't select, we can't select who's gonna be saved. I don't have the power of selection to look at somebody and say, well, you can be saved, but you can't be saved. We don't have that power. Hello. Can't say we're just looking for the people that are dressed in custom made suits and ties and uh, vote Republican. We can't say that, folks. Hello? Whosoever will. Whosoever will may come. All right? And Paul said, I have a desire. And he said, I feel an obligation. So in verse 15, he said, So I am eager to come to you in Rome too to preach the good news. Let's read verse 16 together. Are you ready? For I am not ashamed of this good news about Christ. It is the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes, the Jew first and also the Gentile. How many feel that way about the gospel of Christ? You're not ashamed, not ashamed of the gospel. How many love the Acts 2.38 message? I'm not interested in selling out Acts 2.38. I'm not interested in trading it for something else. 
That is the gospel. And that is the power of God unto salvation. I'm going to ask our facilitators to give us some brief testimonials regarding an individual that they were instrumental or someone else was instrumental in winning to the Lord Jesus. Sister Henson, would you like to start with that one? Okay. <laughs> Doesn't she look nice tonight? She is so cute. She really is. 38 years old and just as cute as she can be. say uh, there was a lot of people around in our lives that we have helped win to the Lord. And I, as Bishop already said, this is a family that does this, a group of people that helps win souls. And I think many times uh, uh, through home Bible studies, we did a lot of those. Uh, we did home friendship groups. I feel like these are keys in helping win a soul. Right. And along the way, uh, they straggle away, and then we have Ephraims to pray for. But I think it's wonderful when we see a soul, and we go, and we go, and we find that soul. And I think I go to the grocery store a lot, or some store. Goodwill, goodwill. <laughs> Wherever it is, it don't matter. And I'm dressed in my Sunday best when I go to the store. So therefore, I am trying to be a witness. And I think that's the key thing here, to win a soul. And even the down and outer will see you and think, well, I, I wish I could be like that. But they can. They can have that spirit within us that draws them to you. And I think it's wonderful. And I, th I think that the souls that have been won through our ministry <clears throat> mainly has been through home Bible studies, friendship groups, all my little notes I wrote, all the texting I've done, some of you, or whatever. It's something that God has put in our hearts to do these ministries. Sister Well. Let me tell you about Fenya. That Sunday morning, she drove by the church, turned around, and came in just at offering time. When the pastor began to preach, I left the piano that I was playing, and I went to her and talked to her briefly and asked if I could sit with her. Yes, I did. Leave my seat and went over here. Even after she was converted, I sat with that lady about two years. I tried to find a common ground. She liked to shop, so we shopped. We both liked plants and gardening, so that's what we talked about. That's what we did together. There is a way to reach people, and you have to give of yourself unselfishly. Right. And I sat with her for two years and up until the time that we left Grand Rapids and came to this area to live. Through our true friendship, she was one. Other people had their hand in it also, but she was one to Christ and has made a wonderful disciple. That was 12 years ago and now her husband is coming to church with her. It's taken her 12 years, but he's coming to church with her. She does not hesitate to tell anybody that she is in the church today serving the Lord because somebody sat with her, somebody took an interest in her, somebody loved her, somebody understood her, and somebody guided her. That's the power of working one-to-one -one with people. Mark was an Ephraim. 
We were driving in another state on deputation one time, and one of us commented out, and there was a restaurant we had eaten in, and we would like to go back there because we enjoyed the food so much. Well, we found it. We ate, and as we were eating, there were two businessmen that walked in and sat down close to us. But uh, before we ate, we prayed. And while we were eating, Mark came over the table and looked at my wife, and he said, are you folks UPC? She said, how did you guess? <laughs> and uh, we talked to him a little bit, helped him to see his need of Jesus. And while his colleague was watching, Mark knelt down by, beside our table, and we had prayer there in the restaurant in front of God and everybody else. We gave him some literature, and that night as we were praying in our hotel, a weeping Ephraim called me and said he had prayed through in his hotel. He was speaking in tongues. I referred him to a church in the area. He became involved, and the last I heard, he was preaching the gospel. The required time and not being ashamed of the gospel, it really works. probably still talk about some more testimonials, but our next question is what can a believer do to strengthen his or her passion and let me add also skill or ability for soul winning? What can a believer do to increase their passion or their skill for soul winning? Some folks are more natural at soul winning than others. I heard one sure and <laughs> one that's right and a whole lot of hesitation. That's understandable. But I'm going to say it again. Some folks are more natural soul winners than other people are. My mother never met a stranger. She could talk to anybody, anywhere, anytime. It didn't matter if they were a millionaire shopping at Goodwill, which sometimes millionaires do shop at Goodwill. That's one reason why they're millionaires, maybe. <laughs> it didn't matter to her if it was a person that was dirty, unkempt, or if they were dressed nice. Whenever I took my mother anywhere, she was always having conversations with everybody around her. Almost had to pull her out of the store. She just was so gifted at talking to people. Now that's not my gifting, to just turn around and talk to everybody that's in the store. That's not my gifting. Hello? My personality, because most of you know this because you've sat under me for a while, so you know this, but my personality is if I go to the store, I go for a purpose. And I know which aisle it is, probably, and where it is on the shelf. Hello? And I go get it, and I go pay for it, and I leave. <laughs> I did walk out of a restaurant one time, here in town, without paying. I had stopped to talk to the owner for a moment, and the waitress, and... Uh, I walked right out the door and didn't pay. Didn't even think about it till the next morning when I woke up. Ah! I drove over to that restaurant, walked in, and the owner was there. He said, I knew you'd be back. <laughs> but I'm not one just to typically strike up conversations with people that I don't know. That's just not my personality. So I have to overcome that. I have to, I have to make an effort. I, I want to tell you, I have to make an effort to overcome that. And I try to, to make that effort. I try to put forth that effort to connect with people. And my, for my mother, it was easy. And she talked to them, she might talk to them about plants. 
And the next thing you know, she's talking to them about baptism in Jesus' name and the Holy Ghost. She could just do it so smooth. Just, whew. well, for me, it's not that easy. I have to work at it more. Yes. But what I want to say to you is you can overcome your limitations. I wish you would say that this with me. I can overcome my limitations. Would you say that with me? I can overcome my limitations. I want us to say it again. I can overcome my limitations. What did Paul say, that famous verse in Philippians? I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. I can overcome my limitations. Now, we had something happen just last week uh, with the guest speaker here, the Bridges. Uh, and uh, I'm sorry we missed Sunday. I uh, heard he did a very fine job Sunday, and I was glad to hear that. Great service Sunday here. Sister Henson and I were preaching down in Kego Harbor Sunday, and we had a great service there. But the Bridges, the McGee's, and my wife and I went out to eat and uh, together. This was on Saturday or Friday? 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 Saturday? Okay. Anyway, we're at the restaurant, and uh, a young lady, I'd say maybe 30 years old, was our waitress. And she was so very nice, very courteous, but I detected something about her. She had a soft spirit. Now that's kind of, I'm going to just say this, I hope we don't have too many waiters or waitresses here, but that's kind of unusual for a waiter or waitress to have a soft spirit. Many of them have lived hard lives. Now some of them are great people, good moms, good dads, so we're not going to put everybody in the same boat. But many waiters or waitresses have been through a whole lot. And some of them are very crusty, very hard. But I detect that she had a soft spirit. And so as we were wrapping up the meal, I said to her, I called her by name, and I said to her, you have a soft spirit. I detect you have a soft spirit. I said, make sure you keep that soft spirit, okay? And I noticed, and everybody else at the table noticed that she was touched by what I said. I just left it at that. She left the table. She brought the bill back, and as she was bringing the bill back, I slipped the business card over to my daughter. I said, put this with the bill, one of the church cards. Put it with the bill. And then, as she came back, Sister Bridges spoke to her and, and said something nice to her. I, I, I don't remember exactly what it was. But then she said, let me, let me say something in your ear. And the waitress bent down, and Sister Bridges spoke in her ear. And she later told me what she said. She said, I don't know what you need right now in your life, but God knows, and Jesus loves you. And then she did her best to connect them to the McGee's, that lady, to the McGee's and the Henson's. And uh, she bragged about our faithfulness here in the city. And she said, you can trust these folks. The lady, and then she said to her, she noticed that the lady, there was tears came in her eyes. And she said, can I pray for you? And the lady said, yes. She, now she was bending down so Sister Bridges could talk in her ear. Sister Bridges began to pray for her and the waitress began to weep. And she actually laid her hand on her head and prayed for her. Quiet prayer. You don't have to say, I need everybody's attention because we're getting ready to pray. No, 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 that's Pharisaical. No, you can do it softly. And that's what Sister Bridges did. Probably people at the next table didn't even know what was going on. But she prayed for her. I'm believing that lady was touched. She walked away with tears. I'm believing she's going to end up here. Now, for me to say what I said to her, you have to understand, I had to overcome a limitation of mine. But I felt that there was a softness in her spirit. And the moment I said it, it opened up her heart. So folks, you can overcome your limitations. You don't have to quote Bible to people all the time. I mean, we need to be ready to quote Bible, but sometimes it's just a kind word. All right? So uh, let's let some of these other folks, what can people do to strengthen their
passion for soul winning or to increase their skill at soul winning or share another testimonial with us. Sister Henson. Uh, just as uh, Bishop has said, you know, just saying Jesus loves you to somebody, and most of them I have noticed have heard that in their childhood somewhere. Maybe their mama or their grandmother or their daddy saying, yes, Jesus loves you. And they respond to that just saying, Jesus loves you is a great tool of winning a soul to God. <clears throat> um, how can you do it for soul winning? Well, um, I think you got to be gentle. And you don't start out by saying, let me tell you about Jesus. <clears throat> uh, you need to be baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost. Well, honey, most of them don't even know what Jesus is nowadays or what the Holy Ghost is. So that's a very little thing to do. But it, it's that gentle touch that you give to them. I like that. And love them and care for them. And even in the store, when there's times when I have been not looking, I've been looking for something else and going about my business, and someone will come up and speak to me. And I remember, oh, yes. And we, we stop and we chat. We do take a minute to do that. I believe that's important. Take time to stop and whatever. You're never too busy to win a soul to God. Stop what you're doing and take it that God is using you right now. Use it for the glory of God. Amen. Brother Well, that's why. Either another testimonial about winning somebody, or what can a person do to strengthen their passion or their skill for soul? We need to truly believe the gospel and souls that are lost without Jesus. And you have to pray, pray, and pray. Right. We were on deputation one time, and God laid a city on my heart in Chile. It's the southernmost city of any significant size in the world. It's clear down on the Straits of Magellan. And I prayed, I asked churches across this country to pray. And uh, never felt anything, just kept praying. And so finally we went back to Chile and started back into the work. One day one of the Bible school graduates came into my office and said, Pastor, can we talk a little bit? I said, well, sure. He said, God has burdened me for the city of Punta Arenas. It means Sandy Point. Well, that's a city I had been praying for for months. Right. And so I said, well, I don't have money to send you right now, and the National Fund doesn't. He said, it doesn't matter. I'll go myself. His wife got a job. He quit his job got on the bus and rode 46 hours to go to that city. I said, you go, and when you have some believers, you call me and I'll come and baptize them. He wasn't even authorized to baptize yet. I said, you call me and I'll go and baptize them. In about three months, my phone rang, and he said, Brother Will, said, uh, this whole say, I'm done here in Punta Arenas, and I got some folks that need to be baptized. Yes. I said, all right, when do you want to do it? We set up an appointment about two weeks. I went to Punta Arenas, Chile. Now, folks, I promise you, I baptized them right. Now, there were icebergs floating around in the Straits of Magellan, north of where I was baptizing, but I baptized them right. But it didn't take long. <laughs> but today, there is a thriving church yes. in the southernmost city. I think it's the southernmost city, uh, most, so, excuse me, southernmost apostolic church in the world. Awesome. You can't go further than the Straits of Magellan and be in the United States or be in the continent of South America. So. It works if we are touched, if we believe souls are lost without Jesus, 
Now, that was a long ways to go. And uh, it took a lot of praying. But there's a church there today because God answers prayer. Sister Well, either another testimonial of somebody won, or what can we do to sharpen our passion, our skill, for our soul winning? For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they hear without a preacher or someone to witness? So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Being in love with Jesus will give you a passion for souls. When he's our love, when he's our life. And we have to realize that someone has to preach, someone has to teach, someone has to witness to that person, or they will not be saved. If we're saved, the responsibility is ours to witness to people. Passion for soul winning is fueled by keeping Jesus Christ the center of our lives. Two key points in strengthening our Christian walk are to read his word daily and pray continually. Amen. Sister Henson said something that in reaching out to people, just the simple words, Jesus loves you, can sometimes unlock a heart. How many of you, question here now, think about this for just a moment. This will not include everybody, I'm sure, but I'm quite sure this will include some people. How many of you have read the book by Nikki Cruz, The Cross and the Switchblade? How many have read that book? Hold your hands up. Nikki Cruz. Nikki Cruz was a gangster, a gang leader in New York City. A vicious, vile gang. And uh, there was a preacher, maybe a group of people on the street corner. I think it was a group, as I remember. And they were having street service. They were singing. And uh, there was a preacher that was preaching. And Nikki Cruz and some of the gang came by, and they harassed them. And at some point in that event, the person in charge looked toward Nikki Cruz, looked him right in the eye, and said, Jesus loves you. And Nikki Cruz said when he, that preacher spoke that to him, something broke inside of him. Now, unfortunately, he was, not, as far as I know, was not connected to the whole truth. But he did have a conversion, and he had a changed life, and he actually began an evangelistic ministry reaching out to troubled youth in New York City. It all started with somebody sincerely looking at him and saying, Jesus loves you. Again, you don't have to be profound in the scriptures to be a soul winner. You don't have to be. If they ask you a question that you don't know, you, you simply say to them, you know what? I don't know the answer to that, but I'll get the answer for you. Hello? I'll get the answer for you. Again, we, we, we sometimes elevate soul winning like it's way up here. But soul winning's in the streets. Soul winning's in the neighborhoods. Soul winning's in the offices. Soul winning's in the factories. Soul winning's in, in the family. And you know, I was thinking about this today. One of the words we often hear with soul winning is burden. Burden. And I do think that word does fit. But I'm not sure that it's the preferred word about soul winning. I think the preferred word, we would be better off if we used the word exciting. Burden sounds kind of heavy. <laughs> sounds like kind of low. It's like some people would feel, man, I got enough burdens. I don't need another one. But folks, soul winning is more than a burden. When you really get involved in soul winning, those of you that have done this, you'll know what I'm talking about. I've driven my car to a home Bible study on ice, icy roads. 
and had to go very slow and careful, but so excited to get there, to have a chance to share another Bible lesson with a person that we were hoping to win to God. Come on, somebody. Soul winning, it's not just a burden, it's exciting. It's exciting. I have watched people at this altar. I've also had the same experience. People that were a primary cause and somebody being a guest here. And that guest heard the gospel and that guest came to the altar and that guest repented. And some of those guests were taken to the baptistry and they were baptized in Jesus' name and some of them got the Holy Ghost in the baptistry. Some got it before they got to the baptistry. Some got it later. The primary cause of those people, those people like that, you watch them while that person's repenting. You watch that primary cause. Watch them. Look at the look on their face when that person's getting baptized. Yeah. That's good. I've never seen a primary cause for a soul being one who was getting the Holy Ghost, the person getting the Holy Ghost. Never seen the primary cause stand there and say, somebody had to do it. <laughs> somebody had to do it. No, 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 folks. Soul winning is exciting. What a thrill to see somebody kneel at the altar, lift their hands, and repent to God. What a thrill to see them baptized in the only saving name, the name of Jesus. And I promise you, if you're the primary cause, when they get the Holy Ghost, you're going to get the Holy Ghost all over again. Because it's exciting. It's exciting. Not just a burden. It's exciting. Well, let's go to the scriptures. Try to keep an eye here on the time and move along. And I can't really blame the group. Because I think I'm doing most of the talking, so I can't blame the group. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 19 through 23. This is the Apostle Paul. I am free and belong to no one. But, now there's a lot of people that feel like Paul in that first statement. I am free and belong to no one. Mm -hmm. But look at what he said next. But I make myself a slave to all people to win as many as I can. Now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a confession to you here right now. Bishop is not satisfied with his soul winning efforts. I'm not satisfied. I've won some people to God, been a primary cause, not the only cause, but I've been a primary cause in winning some people to God. Even you are aware of this. We've even been able by the grace of God to convert some Trinitarian preachers and see them baptized in the name of Jesus. And some that didn't believe in the Holy Ghost received the Holy Ghost. But I'm not satisfied with my soul winning efforts. I'm still breathing. I'm still alive. I want to win some more people to the Lord. Anybody feel that way? I'm still here. Thank God. But I want to win some more people to the Lord. Paul said, I make myself a slave to all people to win as many as I can. Now look at this. This is really neat. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. I myself am not ruled by the law. He's talking about the Old Testament law. But to those who are ruled by the law, I became like a person who is ruled by the law. I did this to win those who are ruled by the law. Wow. To those who are without the law, the rebels, the Gentiles, I became like a person who is without the law. I did this to win those people who are without the law. But really, I am not without God's law. I am ruled by Christ's law. To those who are weak, I became weak so I could win the weak. I have become all things to all people so I could save some of them in any way possible. Now, folks, that's how you overcome your limitations. That's how you overcome. He said, I do this because of the good news so I can share 
in its blessings. So a key question is, what can an apprentice of Jesus do to sharpen his or her skills in personal evangelism and soul winning? How can I overcome my limitations? How can I overcome my limitations? You've heard me tell this story before, and I put that disclaimer in there so that you know I know I'm telling it again, okay? But there was a young man in South America, I think it was Colombia if I remember correctly, who was paralyzed. He was confined to a bed most of the time. They may have put him in a wheelchair or something, I don't know, but most of the time he was confined to a bed. And he talked to his pastor one day and he said, I don't, I'm not able to get out among people and yet I want to win some people to God. And the pastor said to him, well, I'll tell you what you can do. Make a list of people that you'd like to see saved and pray for them every day. So he made a list of 50 names. He stuck the note in his Bible and every day he prayed for those 50 names. The missionary told that the man, young man passed away. Some time later, he passed away. It was not until a few months later that they came across the 50 names in his Bible. Somebody came across it and discovered what it was. And they took it to the missionary. And out of those 50 names, 49 of them had been baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost. 49. I'm just simply saying, folks, if you want to, you can. You can if you will. You can overcome. You can overcome your limitations. This comes to me right now. Brother Tommy Kraft told this story. He said there was a fellow in his church that came to him, and the fella had a problem. It's a common human problem, and that was that he would stammer and stutter. And uh, Brother Kraft said he took him quite a bit of time to get the message out, but he ended up telling the pastor that he wanted to do bus ministry. And Brother Kraft said, I thought, goodness, inside he's thinking that will never work because it takes the guy so long to get a sentence out. And, uh, but Brother Kraft said there was something about the sincerity that touched him. And uh, so Brother Kraft said, I'll tell you what, we'll get a bus for you. We'll get a driver for you. And we'll let you work to build a route. And Brother Kraft said that man ended up filling up that bus. Every week it was full. And so Brother Kraft called him aside one day and he said, and he said you know, you and I both are aware that you have this challenge, this physical challenge, this communication challenge. He said, how in the world are you filling up this bus? And now this is gonna be a poor imitation here, but he said, well, 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 brother, brother, brother Kraft, you know, you know, you know, when I go to the door, you know, when I knock on the door, and the person comes to the door, Brother Kraft, uh, when the person comes to the door, I tell them I'm here, I'm here for, for bus ministry from First, First Pentecostal Church. And Brother Kraft said, do you actually pause and, and have this trouble stammering and stuttering? When you ask people to come to church, he said, yes, yeah, yes, Brother, Brother Kraft. He said, but it seems like I always stutter at the right time. And they say, yes. <laughs> I want you to understand you can become... Get rid of your excuses. Put them on the altar. Repent of them. 
Say, God, I can overcome this. With you, I can overcome my limitations. I can overcome my hesitations. I want to be a soul winner. Sister Henson, would you like to comment on that? What can we do to increase our skills? Uh, first of all, we first need to spruce up what we have inside of us. And that's through prayer. Have a little prayer meeting. And ask God to direct you to go where, do what, whatever. And you do this every day. But I think before you go out, Make sure you've had a prayer time and you understand what you're going for, not just to get groceries or to buy something or to go eat or to go to school, da da, or to work, but you already in your heart have a purpose. I want to win a soul today and have it in your heart that I want to do it today. Lord, I want to meet that soul today. And <clears throat> there's times that I have prayed, and I've met that soul. Uh, sometimes they've come to church, sometimes they don't. But you go back out the next time, and you ask God again. Yeah. You continually ask him to, be, to make you a soul winner. And, of course, in our church, we have some that we call soul winners. Yes. But we all can be a soul winner some way, through something, text, call, write, visit, whatever you got to do, that love. Right. Okay. We have different giftings. We don't have the same giftings. I spoke of my mother versus me. Very different in our approach to people. But we can overcome our limitations. I want us to say that again. I can overcome my limitations. Would you say that out loud? I can overcome my limitations. Now, 1 Corinthians 9, 22, part B of the verse says, this is the Apostle Paul. He said, yes, I try to find common ground with everyone, doing everything I can to save some. This is a, this is a great key to soul winning. It's not complicated. It's not complicated. It's simple. Whenever you start to interact with anybody, to try to find common ground. I, I, in my younger years, I did a lot of door knocking and uh, knocked on doors. What I would try to do is I would try to identify something at the house that I could immediately mention to the person that came to the door. For instance, if they had a lot of lovely plants around their house that was well manicured, or if there's an old uh, antique vehicle sitting in the driveway, as soon as you can in the conversation to insert some, something like, I noticed you got such a well manicured lawn, beautiful flowers, and if they've spent hours and hours and hours and hours working on those, they don't mind talking about them. Hello? So finding common ground. Paul said, that's what I do. He said, I try to find common ground with everyone, doing everything I can to save some. So question, what are some ways to find common ground with unsaved persons? Brother Well, why don't you start us off? Dry tears. I was driving down through Chile one time. I, pardon my referring to that, but I'm, I've been a missionary for so long I can't get away from it. And I came to a city that I had driven through several times. And all at once, tears began to roll down my cheeks. We did not have a church there. I did not know one soul in that city. But I began to weep. And tears does something to you. It changes you. It may not change other people too much, but tears will change you. And so as I wept over that city, 
I went back time and time again. The day came that we got to have a pastor there. And I was so enthused and so excited. We're going to have a church in Chiyon. Do you know that rascal backslid? And closed the church after I'd cried over them so much. But it didn't quit. And finally today, if you could go there and see it, there is a young couple that's pastoring that church. They got a thriving church. And you see, it works. When we get moved enough within ourselves, my tears won't move you. Oh, you may face say, well, poor Brother Will, he's having a bad day. His chain must have broken or something. But chain, prayer, uh, tears will change you. Tears will change you. If you can't get a hold of soul winning, try tears. It'll make a difference. As you said, Bishop, just become aware. Be, be sensitive to people. Be observant. And you, you can talk just a little while and find out what people are thinking, what they like, and try to get that common ground with the people. And uh, as Paul became everything to all men, sometimes we have to do that. Uh, we have to leave our royal robes and become a servant to identify with people. Uh, you might have to become poor or, or appear poor to reach a poor person. We never should feel superior in any way. I believe it was Dwight Moody that said, we have life but no lips. What he meant by that is that we love our life. We love walking with God. We love life living for God, but we have no lips to declare what he's done for us. So we need to get some lips along with our good Christian life. I believe that sharing our testimony is one of the best ways to gain a common ground because everybody will, has a need down deep, even if they don't admit it, everybody has a need in their life. And your testimony is just a simple story of what Christ has done in your life. It doesn't have to be long. Actually, I think about three minutes is long enough because it's not about me. It's about them and it's about Jesus. Just tell what God has done for you. Tell about, just briefly tell about your life before Christ, how you came to know the Lord, and then what he's doing in your life now and continuously. We have to have this common ground with people and we don't, we don't want to, people to think that we are perfect, that we're also a work in progress, and that God is still working on us. And if some of you, like me, uh, became a Christian at a very young age, uh, if you're talking with somebody that is old like me, um, they, they really can't relate if they need the Lord now. They really can't relate to a child receiving the Holy Ghost. So I say just we need to take some point in our life where we really made a, a turnaround or where God really did something for us and maybe start from that point to tell what God has done for us. But we have to be observant and talk with people. Uh, get out of your shell. Now, for some of us, some of us are more extroverted than others. Introverts do have uh, a problem, but we have to forget ourselves and not, not think about what are they thinking of me. We want them to think on Jesus, and I don't want to talk a lot about myself when I'm witnessing to people, just enough to spark their interest because I want to know about them because I want to know how to reach them. That's good. <clears throat> I heard a Baptist preacher say, at a conference, this was many years ago, he said, I have no problem with the Pentecostals talking in other tongues. 
He said, the problem I have with them is that many of them don't use their native tongue to witness about Jesus. And when I heard that, I was convicted. It's great to talk in tongues, folks, but you're not going to convert anybody when you're talking in tongues. You're going to have to speak their language. Come on. So we have to open our mouth and we have to speak. Acts chapter 18, verses 24 to 28. Now a certain Jew named Apollos, born in Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord though he knew only the baptism of John. He didn't have the whole truth. But the truth that he had, he spoke it boldly. So he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Aquila and Priscilla heard him, look at these next four words, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. They didn't do it in front of other people. They didn't castigate him, demean him. They waited till he was through and then they said, could we speak with you? They took him aside and they explained the way of God more accurately. And when he desired to cross to Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him. And when he arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace. For he vigorously refuted the Jews publicly, showing from the scriptures that Jesus is the Christ. So Apollos would be what we would call a denominational preacher. And he was bold. But they took him aside and they explained the, the word of God more accurately to him. Key understanding, top of page four, there is an enormous difference between debating or arguing and explaining the scriptures. Debating, I'm not sure that it's ever won very many people. Arguing, I'm not sure that that's won very many people. But if you can get somebody who is open and you can explain the scriptures to them, that has won a lot of people. All right? So we don't want to, we don't want to demean people we don't want to castigate them. We don't want to throw off on them. We don't want to throw off on their church. That's why I think even in our church, we should be very careful. I didn't mention a denomination tonight, but I mentioned it in a positive way, that he actually convicted me. But I don't think we should throw around denominational names in our church and throw off on denominations. Folks, that's not what we're here for. We are not here to throw off on other denominations. We are here to declare the truth, to tell people you must be born again. George Whitefield had 3,000 sermons printed in his files. And somebody asked permission to look at them. And every one of the sermons was titled, You Must Be Born Again. 3,000 sermons. And they asked George Whitefield, why did you name all of these sermons by the same title? He said, well, I guess it's because you must be born again. <laughs> Praise God. I want you to look at Acts chapter 8, verses 25 through 39. This is talking about Philip going to Samaria and uh, actually leaving Samaria then to go to the desert. Now in Samaria, there was a great revival. Philip went in, much like the person that Brother Wells spoke about that went into a city and started a church. Philip went into Samaria where there were no believers and he had a great revival. There were miracles, there were baptisms, but nobody had received the Holy Ghost. So they sent down the apostles 
couple of them to Samaria. They laid hands on the folks and they received the Holy Ghost. Now, with this great revival going in Samaria, verse 26 says, And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise, and go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem to Gaza, which is desert. Now, these should be terms you're familiar with because they're still in the news. Jerusalem, Gaza. All right? So the, the Holy Ghost sends him toward Gaza. And the way in between there is desert. So what did he do when the Holy Ghost spoke to him? I, he, did he say, I can't leave this great revival. Look at, the, look at this crowd, hundreds of people. No, no, no. He was obedient. This is key, folks. To be a soul winner, you've got to be sensitive to the Holy Ghost. If you're not sensitive to the Holy Ghost, good news. You can become sensitive to the Holy Ghost. All right? As he arose and went, behold, a man of Ethiopia, an eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. Look at this. Who had the charge of all her treasure. And he had come to Jerusalem to worship. Even though he lived in Ethiopia, he had been reading the Old Testament. And he believed in the God of the Old Testament. And he said, I've got to make a trip to Jerusalem I want to worship the God of the Old Testament. So he goes to Jerusalem. Now, look at the next verse, verse 28. He was returning. He's already left Jerusalem. He's headed back to Ethiopia. And he's sitting in his chariot reading Isaiah the prophet, or Isaiah. Now, I want you to notice this. Don't overlook this. He went to Jerusalem. Who's in Jerusalem? the 12 apostles and hundreds of believers. And the man leaves still not knowing anything about Jesus. Are you catching that? He leaves Jerusalem. He went to worship God. Surely somebody would make contact with this hungry man. But nobody did. And so he's headed back and he's reading Isaiah the prophet. The Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to the chariot. Philip ran to him, apparently ran alongside the chariot for a ways, and heard him reading the book of Isaiah. And he said to the man, Sir, do you understand what you're reading? He said, How can I, except some man should guide me? And he, and he desired, Philip, that he would come up and sit with him. Now, the place of the scripture where he read was this. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter. Where is that in Isaiah? What chapter is that in? You know. Isaiah 53. The place where he was reading, he was led as a lamb to the slaughter. And like a dumb lamb before his shearer, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet? Of himself or of some other man? And this next verse is so awesome. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. Three steps in this verse to effective soul winning. Number one, begin where the person is. He began at the same verse. He didn't say, let me go back to Genesis 1. No, he began right where the eunuch was. That's where he began. We must begin where people are. That's, that's the importance of finding common ground. And then Philip opened his mouth. And it wasn't about Philip. He shared with him about Jesus. Praise God. If the, all of us here would pray about these three steps, Lord, help me when I meet people to begin where they are. I could tell you story after story tonight, 
And I don't want to do that because I don't want to just drag this out. But I can tell you story after story of talking to people and beginning where they are. And how the Lord uses that. When you find common ground. But then you've got to open your mouth. That's the hardest part for some of us. Now for some of you, it's not hard at all. You do it all day long. But for some of us, to open our mouth, it's a little more difficult. Hello? And then we don't, Paul said we don't preach ourselves. We preach Christ Jesus the Lord. I can't save a person, but Jesus can. I can't change their life. I can't break the strongholds. I can't break the chains, but Jesus can. I want to say just one or two more things, and we're going to wrap it up. I think we're doing all right. Well, we went on just a little bit over the, of what I wanted to do. But anyway, let me just say this. Folks, when you get involved in soul winning and you're sincere about it, without you even knowing it, the gifts of the Spirit will kick in. The gifts of the Spirit will kick in. You have the Holy Ghost? Then those gifts are available to you. I, uh, in my wallet, I carry a, a card from the United Pentecostal Church. Certifies that I'm an ordained minister in good standing. And I appreciate that card. I cherish that card. But that card doesn't give me access to the gifts of the Spirit. Well, he can use the gifts of the Spirit because he's got a card. That's crazy. No, I have access to the gifts of the Spirit. You have access to the gifts of the Spirit because we have the Holy Spirit. And a word of knowledge will kick in. A word of wisdom will kick in and you don't even realize what's happened. You just started talking. And a word of knowledge will come to you or a word of wisdom you will speak. What did Jesus say to the apostles? Don't think ahead of time what you're going to say when you become come before kings and governors. For in that moment, the Holy Ghost will give you what to say. I've had it happen, folks. You can have it happen. God wants to use us to reach this world. Let's stand together right now and let's lift our hands and let's ask God to help us to be sensitive to the Spirit to be able to win people to the kingdom of God. Oh, Lord, would you help us tonight? The gifts of the Spirit are available to all of us that have the Holy Ghost. And they will kick in without us even thinking about it. It will just happen. Because, Lord, you are the one who gives the gifts. You're the operator of the gifts. And we need the gifts of the Spirit to be effective. You're okay. To be effective in soul winning, we need the gifts of the Spirit. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. If you want to be, a, if you really want to, not just for me, if you really want to be a soul winner, would you lift your hands and tell Jesus that right now? Would you ask Jesus to help you overcome your limitations? Would you help him to be, ask, ask him to help you be alert when you meet people? Would you ask him to help you find common ground? In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Come on, let's talk to him, folks. If you want to be a soul winner, Let's talk to Jesus. Let's talk about his word. Let's talk to him right now. Jesus, I want you to help me overcome my limitations. I ask you to help me to be sensitive to the Holy Ghost. In the name of Jesus, 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 in the name of Jesus.